good evening everyone and uh, good morning uh, professor peter hichfel uh, thank you very much for uh, agreeing to give a talk in our webinar series you know uh, we call them pond talks this is the fifth in the series and we thank you very much for agreeing to give uh, a talk today i really liked your abstract and uh, i'm looking forward to listening to your talk you started with uh, uh Brian Pippard statement the cat and the cream i'm sure at the end of your lecture the ang innocents were in the audience you know wishing to break a uh, new ground <laughs> would have a great hope that the cream is uh, not gone and, and 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 the bowl is still not empty uh, so very much looking forward to your uh, talk and i request my colleague shantanu to introduce the speaker Uh-oh. <laughs> shall, shall, I shall I introduce myself? <laughs> Would that be easier? <laughs> Since uh, Shantanu said uh, he would introduce you, I haven't uh, kept a copy of your CV. because you 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 are well known in the field uh, uh, you know professor peter is from the university of uh, florida uh, shall i continue yeah, <laughs> <laughs> okay i haven't had to do this for a while but poor shantanu is having trouble um yeah so let's start with um i got my phd in princeton long ago in 1985 i guess and then i did a postdoc in munich uh and then after that a postdoc at stanford uh after uh, strongly correlated electron systems and in particular uh, superconductors uh superconductivity in novel novel materials so i think that's all i've got thank you very much i have introduced myself yeah. shantanu no, uh, <laughs> yeah my connection is dropping off again i should have kept a cv of professor uh, <laughs> okay yeah, yeah no no i i had it ready with me just go ahead quickly can you <laughs> no no i think peter already introduced i'll just yeah. repeat myself I did. it's okay it's okay. <laughs> okay all right so should i go ahead and and uh, share the screen yeah please yeah okay let's see if everybody can see this All right, is that coming through at your end? What? Yes, Peter, we can see it. Uh, you want to make it full screen? I will as soon as I correct the spelling of Madras. I just realized I put an extra r in there. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> And now I will uh make it full screen. Okay, there we go. All right, so let me know when that has uh, come through. Yeah, we can I can see it. Okay. All right, great. Um I'll try to turn the slide slowly because apparently there's a bit of a delay which is not too surprising. Um so first of all, let me thank uh, Professor Mukherjee and Professor Rao for the kind invitation to uh, address you today. Uh I had hoped to do this in person. and professor mukherjee was kind enough to invite me to visit uh, more than a year ago uh, but that didn't work out uh, so i hope to do so in the future i'm going to talk today about superconductivity which is a very old field uh, and there are many people i'm sure in the audience who know a great deal about it so i apologize in advance to the experts uh, if what i'm going to tell you is a little elementary but i want to give a sense of the field and its progression uh and maybe uh that will be of some some uh, sociological interest to those uh, people so uh let me start by showing you a, a, a subset of my collaborators over many years working on superconductivity they're divided into the left two thirds of the screen of people who've passed through at one time or another the university of florida uh in my research group uh and i won't name all of them but uh just leave the names up there that uh you probably uh know some of them and uh, from the rest of the world the right third of the screen is uh, my longtime collaborators Doug Scalapino, Thomas Maya, Andrei Chubukov, uh Igor Mazin, 
Indra Nopal and Ilya Yaramin. There are several other others, but I can't fit them all on the slide. So that's uh, uh, one of the great benefits of, of uh, condensed matter physics is that you get to travel the world and meet a lot of uh, interesting people and work with them. Um, <clears throat> Uh, so, uh, the history of superconductivity begins now more than a hundred years ago with uh, the work of Kamerling Onis. Uh, he was interested in a very important problem of his day, which was what does the resistivity of metals do uh, at very low temperatures? And there were theoretical predictions uh, all over the map, shall we say, predictions that resistivity of metals should go to infinity predictions they should go to zero, and predictions they should go to a constant, which I think is all the possibilities. Uh, and in the process of this research, uh, in which he de developed a lot of modern cryogenic tools, he, he saw that the resistivity of mercury uh, went to zero at about 4.2 Kelvin. So this is a very famous picture. Um, I'm a theorist. And so I focus a lot in this talk on the, the theory of superconductivity and how it works. Uh, and so one of the interesting historical aspects is that was immediately recognized as an important problem, uh, that it involved quantum mechanics, uh, and it was uh, unsolved for 50 years. Um, <clears throat> and there are a lot of uh, people who, who worked on it. Uh, some of them came up with uh, some very strange theories from the modern perspective, including a lot of famous people. There's a lovely article by Jörg Schmalian in the compendium 50 years of BCS, uh, which came out a few years ago, which goes into the historical uh, aspects of these theories that didn't work. So it's always important to study what didn't work as well as what did work. And here is a famous quote, no one is brilliant enough to figure it out. That was roughly 1950, the attitude of Richard Feynman. And so for the students, I think it's nice to see that a lot of the famous people that they know about, or Landau, Feynman, Einstein, Heisenberg, all worked on this problem and, uh, and failed. Um, <clears throat> so um, let me tell you about the solution. The solution, of course, was discovered by Bardeen, Cooper, and Schrieffer, BCS, in 1957. Uh, and they pointed out that superconductivity is a macroscopic quantum phenomenon. Uh, they got the Nobel Prize for this work in 1972. They wrote down the wave function, which in second quantized notation consists of uh, creating a paired state of electrons with uh, momentum uh, of one electron in one direction and the spin up and the momentum of the other direction, other electron, excuse me, in the other direction and the spin down. Uh, and uh, this is a coherent superposition of these pairs where each pair has the same quantum mechanical phase. Uh, so <clears throat> there is a so-called order parameter for this uh, state which is uh, zero in, in the normal state, normal metallic state, and non-zero below the transition, which in the BCS theory is the expectation value of this anomalous pair operator. And it is just a quantum mechanical phase times an amplitude, so it's a, a C number. Okay, uh, the standard picture from any textbook of the superconductor is you take a normal metal, with uh, states at low temperatures filled up to the uh, top of the Fermi C. Uh, so that's the Fermi sphere here. You add a weak attractive interaction between opposite spins and opposite momenta particles uh, in the relative orbital angular momentum zero and total spin zero channel. And what you get is a bound uh, uh, bound pairs which are co uh, coherent. This gas of Cooper pairs is the superconducting ground state. Um, <clears throat> now we're going to talk a little bit about why things pair, which is the excuse me. Can you see the slide of the of the little molecules? Yes, I hope. I'm not hearing any any objections. Yeah, yeah, yes. Please. Okay, great. Um, <clears throat> Thanks. Uh, so once you have an attraction uh, you, between electrons, however it's generated, you can pair them. 
And pairs of fermions naively are bosons so that they can both condense into a pair superfluid. This is a picture that uh, a lot of popular accounts give. Um, and it's actually not correct for the very simple reason that this looks like a bunch of molecules, bosonic molecules. And in fact, the BCS theory shows that the length scale, the size of these molecules is much bigger than the interparticle spacing in a simple metal. Uh, in a simple metal, the uh, size of these pairs is going to turn out to be a uh, thousand angstroms, tin, for example. And the uh, distance between electrons on the average is about an angstrom. So you have a picture of a lot of interpenetrating pairs as the true ground state of the superconductor, but then you have to remember that they're all phase coherent, like St. Matthew's Passion in Oxford. Okay, so what's an excited state above the ground state? Well, you can break one of these pairs. And in the process, you generate two fermionic excitations, which are known as quasiparticles, and they can propagate on their own until they repair, and they determine the thermodynamics of the system. Those are called Bogolyubov quasiparticles. And the energy required to break a pair is a distinct energy that characterizes the superconducting state, and it's related to the order parameter I showed you before. It's called delta. So if we look at the density of states of this quantum mechanical system, there uh, is a gap that opens up around uh, the Fermi energy of two delta. Okay. Um, in, um, how can uh, two electrons uh, attract each other? This is the sort of fundamental question that everybody wants to know. And there are a lot of popular accounts of how this works. And uh, the one you'll see, I think most often, uh, even put out by physicists is the dance analogy. Uh, at the, in the high temperature phase, everybody's dancing alone. In the low temperature phase, they pair up. And uh, why does that, uh, why did they do that? Because, uh, they lower their energy or by making themselves happier by dancing together. I hate this analogy. <laughs> I absolutely hate it. Uh, I don't think it tells you anything about the physics and it's very misleading. Uh, the one I prefer that Sh uh, Bob Schrieffer also talked about uh, was the motel bed analogy. If any of you have ever been in a really bad hotel, I hope not, uh, but you might have encountered a mattress that looks like this. And if there are two of you sleeping together, what happens is, you tend to roll towards the middle. So you, the, the two particles deform the medium around them and that leads to an effective attraction. That's the idea. The uh, more uh, exact picture, although it's still very approximate, is that you have an ionic lattice full of heavy ions and then uh, a light electron comes through with very high speed, the Fermi velocity, uh, polarizes the uh, ions around it um, and uh, lives, this polarization lives for a relatively long time because the ions are heavier than the electrons and gives a second electron going in the opposite direction time to come along and take advantage of this polarization. When you do a simple calculation that is associated with this picture, you find that uh, the, uh, the two effects have to be taken into account. First of all, there's always the screened Coulomb interaction between electrons, which is always repulsive. And then there's the uh, electron phonon interaction, which can be uh, attractive in a certain frequency range. Uh, you see, you notice that if omega goes to zero, these two terms in this particular jellium approximation actually exactly cancel each other. So you might think that uh, superconductivity would always be absent or very weak. Uh, but what happens is if you do a more exact calculation, these two terms are still present, but they acquire essentially different prefactors. So that means that one term can dominate or the other term can dominate, which means you get a superconductor or you don't get a superconductor. Uh, before I leave this slide, I want to just note that the essential physics here was that the uh, uh, electrons could avoid each other uh, in time. Uh, they weren't in the same place at the same time, and therefore there isn't a static Coulomb interaction that, that affects them. Uh, and that's important. You see the, the interaction, the electron phonon interaction is frequency dependent. So uh, back to the fact that there are these two prefactors, let me put it back up again, um, you notice that, uh, that uh, there are some elements, for example, in the periodic table which are not superconducting at all. The yellow ones are superconducting at ambient pressure, 
the um, um, green ones are super superconducting at, at pressure, and the white ones we haven't discovered superconductivity uh, at any pressure yet. Uh, so that is simply uh, accounted for by the fact that there are these details of the uh, bonding in these different uh, crystals that uh, prevent um, superconductivity because the Coulomb interaction wins. Okay, so now, um, as some of you heard, uh, Professor uh, Rao mentioned at the beginning, uh, I'm sort of organizing my talk around a famous speech that Brian Pippard gave in 1961 at, uh, at IBM in uh, Yorktown Heights. And it was called The Cat and the Cream. And here is Brian Pippard and, uh, at the time, and here is the uh, famous line, uh, one of several famous lines that I, I, I'm focusing on. I think I might remark that in low temperature physics, the disappearance of liquid helium, superconductivity, and magneto resistance from the list of major unsolved problems has left this branch of research looking pretty sick from the point of view of any young innocent who thinks he's going to break new ground. So um, the idea of my talk is to uh, is particularly address to the young innocents in the audience, namely the graduate students, um, to try to convince you that this was completely wrong. And, and it's very dangerous to make predictions about the demise of a field. <clears throat> so let me show you what happened um, in uh, the several years after uh, Brian Pippard's speech. Of course, there was a decade where a critical temperature of uh, materials that were discovered, electron phonon superconductors, went up slowly. And it did, it did appear that nothing particular spectacular was going to happen. But here's a discovery in 1979 by Frank Steglich. Uh, at um, Darmstadt in Germany uh, of the superconductivity of cerium copper to silicon to. Uh, this was a completely un unexpected uh, discovery because it was already known that the effective masses of the electrons in this material were 100 to 1,000 times larger than the bare electron mass. Uh, and you can see that by noticing the units of the specific heat plot here on the right they're in joules per mole Kelvin squared instead of the usual um, <clears throat> units that you see in specific heats of simple metals, which are millijoules per mole Kelvin squared. And the superconducting jump scales with this uh, enhancement uh, of the mass. And so if you have such large mass electrons, the argument I gave you about the retardation of the superconductivity does seem to be a little bit challenged. And so that's why it was surprising that this was discovered. And, people immediately came up with the notion that this might be a different kind of superconductivity than we had seen before. Uh, and that maybe elect, um, electrons were paired by the exchange of electronic excitations rather than the ionic ones. I'm going to skip forward uh, to 1986 uh, when uh, superconductivity in the cuprates was discovered. Um, and this is the picture of uh, Bednoz and Müller, the discoverers at the Nobel Prize ceremony. Uh, this is their paper in Zeitschrift for Physik uh, from 1986. And I like to say that I came very close personally to this Nobel Prize. Uh, and the reason I came very close is uh, evidenced by this uh, image, which shows you the table of contents of Zeitschrift for Physik in 1986. Here's the Nobel Prize winning paper uh, at page 189, and here's my paper right next to it on page 175. So that's, uh, that's probably the best I'm going to do, but uh, I'm pretty happy with it. Okay, um, <clears throat> that uh, progress after 1986 in, in uh, discovering new materials raised the critical temperature in this class uh, to above 150 Kelvin under pressure in this three-layer mercury compound, and that was a very exciting time. I'm sure people in the audience, I know Professor Boscaron was, was present at this time, and many of us were uh, working day and night to try to understand what was happening in, in these materials. Uh, and this was also the occasion of the Woodstock of Physics at the American Physical Society uh, meeting in 1987 when people were uh, crammed into a ballroom till three in the morning. Uh, sorry. So uh, just a couple of words at this moment. It's a good moment to pause and say, what could we do if we had a high temperature, room temperature superconductor? Um, the speculation began in 1987 
This is Time Magazine discussing the superconductivity revolution and all sorts of possible applications were thought to be just around the corner. Um, of course, if you have a room temperature superconductor, you can save enormous amounts of energy uh, distributing electricity over a large scale grid uh, because you don't lose energy to heat in the transmission through a wire. Um, you can increase the density of uh, power for, for cities much more easily. Uh, there is um, <clears throat> some a a applications in, in renewable power, particularly um, the um, uh, power generation by, by light uh, engines in wind generators. There's the possibility of superconducting circuits. Uh, large magnets uh, are usually the applications people talk about uh, next generation high energy physics and accelerators all all use superconducting magnets um, <clears throat> uh, most of you have been in some excuse me not most of you many of you may have been inside a, uh, a, a mri machine that those are uh, often done with uh, superconducting magnets nowadays and their applications in fusion as well so i'm not going to talk further about applications because that's not my field but we can talk about it at the end if you like so where are coupe rates now? Um, there are a, a number, there, there are many, 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 many papers on coupe rates and the field is still very lively. Uh, most of the issues that make it lively nowadays are, I'm not going to talk about. The superconductivity, ironically, is, is probably the easiest phase of the entire phase diagram to understand. Coupe rates have a, a semi-universal phase diagram they start from an antiferromagnetic insulator, that's AFI. When you dope them, there's sometimes a spin glass phase, SG, but more prominently a pseudo gap phase where uh, you see a gap in the spectrum, but the system hasn't done any long range order, uh, any easily identifiable long range order, a crossover to a strange metal or non Fermi liquid phase, and eventually a metal, it's believed, at, at high doping. Um, the uh, superconductivity, the order parameter in the superconducting state, it's pretty well identified at this point to be D wave. And so um, it is definitely a, a superconductor where the pairing is different from the electron phonon uh, mechanism, which leads typically to a relative angular momentum of S wave, as BCS discussed. Uh, so, what holds these pairs together? Um, we think it's an electronic mechanism, but how does that work? Uh, okay, well, that's a question I'm going to leave for the moment and go on to the next discovery of a new class of materials, uh, the iron-based superconductors in 2008. This is uh, Hosono uh, in his lab in Japan showing a model of, well, actually, I don't know what it's a model of, but that's Hosono. And his lab discovered the iron-based superconductors actually in 2006, but then people got excited when he found this lanthanum um, 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 uh, let's see, <laughs> uh, iron, fluorine, uh, iron arsenide, um, lanthanum oxygen, fluorine, iron ar arsenide. I don't know how to pronounce this, but it's usually called uh, um, nowadays uh, Lefaso. And uh, I heard the, an indication that the recording was stopped. Oh, okay, sorry. Can I continue? Please uh, oh, Please okay. Continue. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. So I, I'm yes, just showing you uh, the, the data yes, from, the, from the first paper here. Um, yes, first of yes. all, the existence of a superconducting dome, rather similar to the coupe rates. That's one of the things that got people excited. And there was a, a, an anomaly in the transport at higher temperatures, which turns out to be a magnetism, long range magnetism. Uh, and uh, as in every good experimental paper about superconductivity, the magnetic properties were also explored. And so this was quickly discovered to be a new class of materials based on iron, which was again surprising because iron is supposed to have a moment and that's supposed to be bad for uh, ordinary S-wave superconductivity. All right. Um, <clears throat> And uh, within a few years, uh, critical temperature was raised, not quite as high as the coupe rates, but up to 70 Kelvin. And so much larger than the, the trend of electron phonon classic uh, superconductors. Um, but I will note that, um, I, I think I forgot to mention this before, 
that MGB2 is about 40 Kelvin uh, TC, and that's supposed to be an electron phonon superconductor. And we'll come back to that in the, in the end a little bit. All right, so this is what these iron-based materials look like. They all have a um, common iron uh, arsenic or iron uh, chalcogenide plane. Um, <clears throat> uh, the irons are in a square lattice, and the uh, pnictogens or the chalcogens are above or below the planes. Then there are various spacer layers. So this is just a small example. There have been many tens of uh, different materials discovered at this point. Um, what's interesting from a theoretical point of view, what's different about these materials is that uh, although they involve these states at the ferrum surface, like the cuprates, uh, there's uh, several bands present and several orbitals, uh, several d orbitals present. Here on the right, you can see that there is a density functional theory calculation for the total density of states, and most of it comes from these iron 3D states. Uh, very little of it comes from arsenic uh, states, which is a few EV below. <clears throat> and you see this plot of the band structure with different colors showing you the orbital weights uh, of each, um, each D state. And if you plot the Fermi surface, uh, you see that even each sheet of, on the Fermi surface has a varying orbital weight as you go around. So there's a lot of interesting new physics that uh, that you get as you um, uh, as you go uh, uh, explore what what the consequences of this are. And <clears throat> in, as far as superconductivity is concerned, the states that live on that strange Fermi surface with the uh, small pockets located at the high symmetry points. Um, are classified by uh, not only symmetry, but also the structure of the gap. So from the point of view of symmetry, let's just restrict ourselves to singlet pairing, which we know is the case because of NMR experiments in these, in these systems. Um, you can have what's now called an S++ state, where on each of these Fermi pockets, I hope you can see my cursor, uh, the sign of the superconducting gap is exactly the same. Uh, magnitude can vary, but the sign is the same. Uh, S plus minus is another state that comes into contention, as I'll show you, where the sign, as designated by the color, is different on the central hole pocket and the exterior electron pockets. I forgot to say that the outer pockets have hole character and the inner pocket. Sorry, outer pocket has electron character and the inner pocket has hole character. And then uh, it's also possible from the symmetry point of view, and you also find sometimes when you do rigorous calculations, uh, that there are nodes of the superconducting uh, gap on certain sheets. So just like the D-wave state, there is a place where the gap goes to zero, and that means there are a lot of quasi-particle excitations possible because the gap is small in those directions. Okay, those are all S-wave states. Why? Because if I rotate each picture by 90 degrees, I get the same state back again. On the other hand, there's also the D wave or B1G representation that's possible. Uh, and that you can see by uh, rotating the picture, you get an overall sign change of the order parameter. Okay, now um, why do we think electron, le electron excitations are responsible for superconductivity and not electron phonon? Well, by 2008, uh, ab initio calculations for electron phonon uh, interactions and the calculation of the so called Eli Ashberg spectral function alpha squared f uh, were pretty accurate. And um, the initial calculations for these materials showed that the total uh, dimensionless coupling lambda was about 0.2, which could not give you anywhere close to the uh, observed critical temperature of 26 Kelvin. So that's fine. Uh, so we have to deal with, you know, somehow uh, pairing by electronic excitations. And I want to uh, go into a little bit of detail here because I know students in particular are very puzzled by the statement that you can get superconductivity from repulsive interactions. That sounds very strange. I've just spent a lot of time convincing you that you can generate attractive interactions in a metal. Uh, and now I'm, I'm going to tell you you can get superconductivity also from repulsive interactions. So these ideas go back to Kohn and Luttinger and also Landau and Pitayevsky around the same time in the 60s. Um, 
if you ignore phonons altogether, theoretically, and you include only repulsive interactions, you can find superconductivity theoretically. And it's because there's a totally new paradigm. Uh, the uh, retarded interaction is no longer necessary because the wave function of the pair avoids the Coulomb interaction in space rather than time. And the way this works is, this is a picture of the so-called uh, Friedel oscillations in a metal. Uh, let's imagine that you put uh, an electron at the origin of the coordinate system here at zero, zero. Um, that's this big peak in the effective potential due to this electron, or due to, due to this charge, uh, in the presence of the electron gas. And it falls off in three dimensions, like one over RQ, but it oscillates, and it changes sign. So the projection into the plane here shows that there are stripes of different sign potential. And you can imagine that if you create a wave function which lives in the attractive part of this interaction, you can still form a pair, bound pair, even though the overall uh, attraction is, uh, the overall interaction, excuse me, is repulsive. And that gives you finite angular momentum pairing because of the uh, need to, to, to have, um, to, to take advantage of that, of those negative regions. So Cohn and Luttinger uh, calculated the effective pairing interaction by looking at the all possible processes between a pair of electrons with K and minus K scattering into a pair of electrons with P and minus P, momenta, and with this repulsive interaction U uh, exchanged, and they summed diagrams up to second order and evaluated the, the critical temperature. And the result that they got, this is kind of fascinating, was um, uh, very similar to the BCS result, except it had a factor of e to the minus 2.5 L, L being the relative orbital angular momentum of the Cooper pair to the fourth power. And the prefactor is the Fermi energy instead of the Debye frequency, and that's an ordinary superconductivity. Now L, the best calculation that was available at the time for superfluid helium-3, which was the fermionic system that was most exciting from the point of view of pairing or superfluidity back then, um, <clears throat> they, uh, the best calculations gave uh, an angular momentum of two. And so um, uh, Cohn and Luttinger predicted that uh, TC would be 10 to the minus 17 Kelvin. So I remember when I was a graduate student, this was kind of a joke. Uh, when we were talking about heavy fermions, we knew it couldn't be Cohn Luttinger because um, because uh, TC was known to be very, very low. However, however, if they had just taken L equal one and inserted it not into this formula, because this is an asymptotic one, but to the correct formula that they found, they would have gotten TC as one millikelvin, which is uh, almost exactly the correct uh, critical temperature for superfluid helium three. So this is uh, a very interesting and very provocative uh, result, as it turns out. So let me summarize a little bit. Um, I have two classes of superconductors that I've told you about so far. One is the conventional superconductor paired by the electron phonon interaction. It's overall uh, attractive interaction in the range of frequencies that, to take advantage of this uh, uh, separation of, of electron and phonon energy scales. And it gives you what we would call an S++ state where the sign is the same everywhere, uh, typically anyway. And then there is the, are the unconventional superconductors, which, are, which typically give you anisotropic or sign-changing pair wave functions, uh, which come from the exchange of electronic interactions. And I've drawn some diagrams here, which are supposed to represent uh, spin fluctuations, but it can be a number of different kinds of electronic ex excitations. Um, and so you see that, that these always lead to sign changing uh, gaps. Uh, and in that case, the overall interaction is actually repulsive. Okay, so let me go into a little tiny bit more detail of, of these theories of spin fluctuation pairing to see a little bit of the guts of the machinery here. Uh, the idea here is that if you do uh, essentially what Cohn and Luttinger did, but go a little bit further, and sum a subclass of diagrams, then you can find that the interaction V of Q and omega up here is essentially proportional to the magnetic susceptibility of the system, the dynamical susceptibility, 
in the random phase approximation. So uh, in, in the random phase approximation, this is a picture of superconductivity that comes from the exchange of so-called paramagnons rather than the exchange of phonons. Um, and uh, this uh, chi zero is just the Lindhard function for the material. And then you sum up these diagrams and, and get, um, of course, this geometric series expression, uh, which is enhanced uh, if the product of u and chi zero gets close to one. And so this can in enhance the uh, pairing at certain particular wave vectors. Um, so uh, in the early, in the mid 60s, it was thought that this could lead to uh, the suppression of TC from spin fluctuations. Uh, because the susceptibility is typically peaked at Q equals zero for a screened Coulomb interaction. But if you have a Fermi surface, which has a, a, a special structure, uh, you can get other results. And so this is the standard picture for the cuprates of the magnetic susceptibility or the effective spin fluctuation pairing interaction as a function of momentum Q. What's seen and known from um, <clears throat> Uh, neutron scattering experiments in cuprates is that there are very strong spin excitations at the wave vector pi pi uh, <clears throat> at the corner of the Brillouin zone. And so the magnetic susceptibility is peaked there. And now the question becomes what happens if you have the BCS gap equation, which I haven't shown you before, but is an integral equation to determine, excuse me, to determine the superconducting gap. What happens if you insert this Overall repulsive, you know, zero is, is the bottom of this picture, although I didn't label it, sorry about that. This is an overall repulsive interaction, but it, it has a contrast between small momentum and large momenta. Um, and, and therefore, if you insert this into the equation, uh, you can solve it. If you put a constant interaction in here, even a constant attractive interaction, uh, <clears throat> sorry, a constant, sorry, not an even move. If you put a constant repulsive interaction in here, you cannot solve this equation because the gap will be uh, one sign and you have a minus sign here and EP, that's the quasi-particle energy, that's always positive. So you need to have this V of P minus P prime solve a change sign from one point in the Brillouin zone to another. And that's in fact what it does in the cuprates. And that, has, uh, that works if the gap function has this property in the bottom right hand corner that uh, a translation by pi pi gives you a minus sign. And that's precisely the property that the D-wave state has. Um, <clears throat> here's a way to see the same thing in two different ways. Um, <clears throat> if you Fourier transform the interaction into real space, you see that um, <clears throat> if you put the first electron at the center, then the uh, nearest neighbor sites are attractive and uh, these other sites, the red ones, are repulsive. Nevertheless, there is some attraction present in the system, which the system can take advantage of. In K-space, you have the same idea. You expand the overall uh, interaction in harmonics, and you can have a situation where the leading harmonic in the S-wave channel is large, but repulsive, and yet you have an attractive D-wave interaction, and the system is smart enough to take advantage of that. So that's the way um, superconductivity from repulsive interactions work. And now go back, let's for a moment to these iron based systems. You have this strange Fermi surface where you have tiny pockets near the high symmetry points of the zone. And now you can see that there is a quasi nesting between the hole pockets in the middle and the electron pockets on the outside. Uh, so there's going to be a very strong scattering wave vector between those two pockets. The susceptibility is going to be peaked there. And uh, that means that if the gap changes sign between these two uh, pockets, then I should be able to solve the gap equation. And that's the origin of the so-called uh, S plus minus state. Okay. Um, now, uh, Let's see, uh, I just want to show you, these are calculations that we did back in the, um, about 10 years ago for the iron-based systems to show you that for realistic systems, um, things are not quite so simple. Uh, first of all, there's a magnetism that you have to worry about, which I haven't talked about really, um, uh, that the original Hosono experiments showed in the transport. 
there is an ordered magnetic phase um, around six electrons per iron. And then as you dope chemically in either direction, you get these gap structures that are showing up. And you see that they can be quite anisotropic as you go out away from the optimal dope point. Um, yeah, I didn't even label my axes here. My, if I, my, a student did this, I would give them a hard time. Um, this is temperature uh, in the vertical axis and hole doping and electron doping. Okay, so um, that's, that's what you get. Now, um, just to finish up the iron-based um, uh, discussion, uh, I'll, I'll mention that there's one active, very active research area right now on iron chalcogenides because uh, the uh, mechanism that I just showed you to create pairs and create superconductivity is not obviously working in those cases. So I'm showing you three materials here. One is uh, uh, lithium hydroxide intercalated iron selenide. This is iron selenide single layer on strontium titanate substrate. And this is um, the uh, alkali intercalated iron selenide. So uh, in the column, sorry, in the row below, you see uh, the angle resolve photo emission images of the experimental Fermi surfaces of these materials. And what you see generally is that the whole pocket is missing. Turns out that the whole band has been pushed down below the Fermi surface. In this last picture, that's not obvious, but this is apparently uh, just a spectrally broad band, and so it, it has a little overlap at the Fermi surface, but the centroid of the band passes below. So you can ask the, the, the question, what happened to the, the mechanism you told us about, uh, where I should have a, um, a strong scattering between the hole pocket at gamma and the uh, electron pockets at M? How can that happen if there's nothing at the Fermi surface at the gamma point? So it suggested that there must be a different kind of um, uh, pairing taking place here. Perhaps it's just a matter of having scattering between the electron pockets, which are fairly well nested, and that will give you uh, a D wave um, order parameter, as it turns out. That's not obvious, but it's true. Um, <clears throat> Uh, but the question still remains, why are these materials among the highest critical temperatures of all the iron-based systems? Um, for example, this is 40 Kelvin, this is 65 Kelvin, this is 32 Kelvin. These are quite uh, high, and the one in the middle is actually the highest. So that's really not understood at the present time. There are some ideas floating around. Okay. Um, do I have uh, 10 minutes left, 15 minutes? Shantanu, can you give me a, a reading? Yeah, I think 15 minutes. Yeah, it should be okay. 15 is okay? Please go. Yes, yes. Okay, go ahead. okay. So let me just tell you about the latest uh, development uh, in superconductivity, which has uh, interested many of us. I mean, there are several I'm, I'm leaving out, but this is a, a main one. Um, and this is a little bit uh, a step backwards in the the story of the march of progress that I've told you about so far, um, because the, the message as of five years ago, I would say, six years ago in the superconductivity community was, if you want to get high critical temperatures, you have to take advantage of electronic uh, excitations, pairing by electronic excitations. And that's a very natural assumption because the energies of electronic excitations are much higher than phonons. Um, but in 2015, uh, Michael Jeremitz in Mainz discovered that when he put hydrogen um, and sulfur under pressure, he started with H2S, sorry, H2S gas. When he put them under pressure in a diamond anvil cell, took them up to 200 gigapascals, uh, he found superconductivity above 100 and a maximum critical temperature of 200 Kelvin. Now that's higher than anything I've shown you by, by so far and was unexpected, let's say, to at least many of us in the community. Not to everyone, but to many of us. And uh, he showed the existence of the uh, Meissner effect, of the isotope effect. It looked, roughly speaking, like an ordinary conventional BCS superconductor that's created only under a very high pressure. This is the resistance you can see. I don't somehow have the 
the, the plot that shows the resistance at 200 Kelvin, but there is one in the paper. I don't know why I didn't select that one. Anyway, uh, this is what happened in the course of the experiment. The H2S gas first formed a, a, a hydrogen sulfide solid compound and then underwent a phase transformation at higher pressures to uh, H3S, expelling some sulfur in the process. And so that was the uh, atomic structure, which gave rise to the correct electronic structure or band structure to support high temperature superconductivity. And unfortunately, it's not stable when you release the pressure, uh, H3S goes away and H2S goes away. Um, but uh, there are some further developments in uh, a couple of years later, my slide is blocked here, so I can't see the year, but maybe maybe two years ago, three years ago, uh, Russ Hemley and Michael Aramitz, both around the same time, came up with this clathrate type structure uh, where the green uh, atoms are lanthanum and the little uh, pink ones are hydrogen. Uh, there's a kind of a cage structure uh, of, of, of hydrogen, uh, which uh, has high energy uh, phonon modes, which give rise to um, even higher critical temperatures around uh, 200, up to about 250 onset temperature, 200, I think, you know, maybe even 250, 260 uh, in, in, this, in this material. Uh, and then, um, okay, so I want to stop here. There are a couple of other materials, but I don't want to mention them yet. Let me just try to get a sense for the students of what these temperatures are. Um, so hydrogen sulfide under two megabars of pressure, that's 210 Kelvin or 203 Kelvin, I think. That's roughly min minus 63 Celsius, which corresponds to the lowest recorded temperature in Yakutsk in Siberia, which is one of the coldest places in the world. Okay. Um, and then if you get up to 250 Kelvin, that's minus 23 Celsius. Some of us have actually experienced that. Uh, and that's the average low temperature in Yakutsk in November. Um, uh, then, if, uh, then recently, about uh, two years ago, there was a, a new paper by Runga Diaz at uh, Rochester reporting uh, room temperature superconductivity. It's not quite known what the structure is. Uh, people are, are working on that very intensively, but at 2.6 megabars, you get uh, essentially room temperature, the average temperature in Yakutsk in June. Okay, and this is uh, this nature paper from Snyder et al. Uh, here are some of the data. This is TC as a function of pressure, and there is uh, some kind of a transition uh, at 200 and um, 40 and then 220 maybe, and then it goes up to 260 and it gets quite high. And these are the resistive transitions that were shown in the, in the original paper. Um, they are very sharp, if you notice. And normally we consider that good, but it's a little worrisome for some people. And I want to mention at this point, and we can discuss it later after the talk, if you're interested that this paper in particular, and also some of the others, has been subject to a, a criticism by Jorge Hirsch and Frank Marsiglio, who have um, uh, pointed out that um, uh, this does not look like an ordinary superconductor. Let's put it in that uh, concise uh, language. I'm going to ignore this critique for the time being, and we can come back to it, as I said, at the end if people are interested. So uh, the triumphalist narrative, if I'm allowed to continue, uh, will show that on this picture of critical temperatures, uh, there are now a bunch of points that are way off scale, um, going up to the new discovery by Diaz, if it's correct, at uh, essentially 300 Kelvin. Um, okay, now the challenge, and I'm going to take a couple of minutes to report on some work that we're doing, which is very material science-y. Um, but I, I think I'm allowed to talk a tiny bit about my own research. And this is that the challenge is to duplicate this, the physics of hydrides, which are at very high temperatures, uh, but at high, too high pressures to be useful for technological applications. So you wanna somehow duplicate this at ambient pressure. So there are two strategies that people are using right now. One is to take binary structures 
and uh, with hydrides that have been discovered already and researched fairly exhaustively at this point, and fill voids with um, a third atom. Uh, and then you test for stability theoretically and calculate TC. I should have mentioned earlier that one of the unique things about the um, H3S discovery, hydrogen sulfide, is that it was predicted theoretically by an ab initio calculation. And that's not normally the way a new superconducting materials are discovered. In the past, it's always been rather serendipitous. Uh, but in this case, it was actually a prediction and Yermitz went out and measured it and found the, the, the superconductor. Um, another thing you can do is to try to use machine learning to analyze the properties of many, 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 many materials. Or if you're theorists, then many, many, many uh, artificially created Eliasberg functions. This is something that we did in my group uh, and found a um, new analog of this, the famous Alan Dines equation for TC, which depends on various moments of the alpha squared F function. Specialists know what I'm talking about. This, uh, others probably will not, but it, it doesn't matter. I just want to show you this is the kind of thing that people are looking at right now. And we found an equation which does a much better job for the critical temperature of the high temperature hydrides after being trained on the low temperature superconductors. Okay, uh, then the next thing you can do is imagine that um, you might be able to create a metastable structure under pressure, which when you relax the pressure remains all the way down to zero GPA. Uh, and uh, there are a couple of pap papers that we've been involved with in my group um, in the past couple of uh, uh, months, few months, uh, which I think are interesting. One is niobium-3 silicon, which is a classic um, uh, material in, that should form, was very similar to materials that form in the so-called A15 structure, which are among the, the highest conventional ISTC conventional superconductors, but it's not superconducting in its ground state for some reason, uh, but you can, because it's not in the A15 structure, it's tetragonal. However, when you apply uh, 10,000, sorry, 1,000 gigapascals of pressure, uh, you can get it into the A15 structure. Now, you can't do 1,000 gigapascals of pressure in a diamond anvil, or maybe you can barely get there, but in fact, this experiment was done in uh, an explosive flux compression experiment at, at Los Alamos National Laboratory. So they put the sample inside an, uh, an imploding uh, uh, explosive material, take it up to about a thousand gigapascals, and lo and behold, at the end of the day, it's in this new metastable structure, A15 structure. Um, and what we did in, in, um, uh, in our group Greg Stewart, one of my colleagues, had this sample in his drawer. It had been sitting there for 30 years since it was made, and it was still superconducting at the same TC. And what we did was um, uh, heated it up uh, above room temperature and tried to probe the thermal barrier to see if we could estimate uh, the barrier height. Um, and then uh, in this uh, second image, I'm showing you recent results on the creation of superconductivity in a material called a tungsten diboride, uh, where uh, we believe that the superconductivity is carried by um, magnesium diboride-like structures, which are present only in stacking faults. Uh, so defect structures, which percolate through the material. Okay, I need to go on a little bit. Do I have five minutes? Or should I stop? Yeah, please. Please go ahead. It's so interesting. Okay. All right. Okay. okay. Wonderful. Wonderful. Okay. So I wanted to say a little bit just at the end about a, another completely different kind of superconducting material, and that's um, twisted bilayer graphene. Uh, this is a tour de force um, uh, experiment by uh, Pablo Harillo Herrero in MIT. Uh, you take a, a layer of graphene. You pick it up with a tip, you put it down on, on the graphene again, but you rotate it by some angle. And there is a particular magic angle where um, <clears throat> interesting things, things happen. Uh, in particular, uh, it was shown already before the experiment by, by Alan McDonald and uh, this person whose name I don't know, Britz, Britzker, Britzer, um, <clears throat> that um, 
if you rotate to this magic angle, what happens is the band structure of the material, no interactions yet, just ordinary band, band theory, uh, goes from being a Dirac cone that we know about, the double Dirac cone from the, from the graphene system, to a flat band um, with a very narrow, yeah, well, uh, sorry, very narrow bands, a series of very narrow, narrow bands near the Fermi level. And you can see this picture here for 1.08 degrees um, that uh, these, uh, these bands might be, uh, might be present there. And, and the idea is, uh, okay, why should spot twisted bilayer graphene be a good unconventional superconductor? Uh, because carbon is not known for having a lot of D electrons, which are going to cause correlations, electronic correlations. But the point here is that the, what's important is the ratio of the uh, bandwidth of the material to the correlation strength. And the bandwidth here is extremely narrow. And so that might mean that this is in a regime where you can see the same kinds of uh, correlations as you see in cuprates. Uh, so <clears throat> this is an uh, experiment where you can now dope these. I think I'm going to skip this slide to get to the end. Sorry, I don't want to go through all this data. Let me just show you the end result here that um, if, if you remember, I showed you a cuprate phase diagram before that's reproduced on the right. This time I've shown not only the whole doped uh, superconductors to the positive range of doping, but also the um, uh, electron doped superconductors to the, the negative range. Um, <clears throat> and compared now with what is seen in the uh, uh, device uh, containing the twisted bilayer graphene, where you control the doping with a gate. And you can go, you can tune the system from a superconductor in a certain range of doping to the, a MOT insulator, uh, which is not a superconductor, it's not even a metal, and then back to a superconductor and then to a metallic phase. So this is a really wonderful playground uh, for superconductivity, and the analogies are very striking. I don't think they're completely established yet, uh, but uh, that's really a, a very active field at the moment. Okay. Okay, uh, I'll mention one cautionary tale um, for the students particularly, is that the, the, the history of superconductivity is punctuated by many, many, many reports of high temperature superconductivity, which, um, which are probably not correct. And I call them, um, I actually stole this from Steve Kivelson, U USOs, Unidentified Superconducting Objects. Uh, and uh, here are just a few examples. Um, uh, aluminum carbon aluminum sandwiches, which were reported to have superconductivity at 300 Kelvin. Graphite powder with uh, water at 300 Kelvin. Uh, a few years ago, there was P-terfinyl, which uh, in angle resolved photo emission had a, had a huge gap. Um, and there are many of these, so I'm not going to go into any detail, but uh, just be I think the message is to be very critical of um, a report of superconductivity unless all of the characteristics of superconductivity have been established experimentally. Okay, so um, I will conclude now. So I've told you that there are two paradigms for superconductivity, the conventional one where the um, <clears throat> interaction has to be retarded in time to avoid the Coulomb force. Uh, unconventional, where the electronic excitations are doing the pairing and you have higher electronic pairs and the system avoids Coulomb interaction in the wave function of, of the higher, higher angular momentum. Um, I think one of the questions that poses itself, to which I don't have a definitive answer, when you see all of these results on the so-called unconventional superconductivity, um, <clears throat> it uh, appears that they might have features in common. Some things appear very different, like for example, the electronic Fermi surface, but if you don't consider that fundamental, then the mechanism itself might actually be common to many of these families. And that's a, an interest, very interesting open question. I told you a little bit about the twisted bilayer graphene story, very little, there's much more to be said, and I'm not an expert. Uh, I've told you a little bit about the um, high pressure story, uh, with hydrides. Um, and I, what I forgot to say, and I think for as a theorist, this is very important. Um, 
what we really learned from uh, these early experiments is that there doesn't appear to be any fundamental limit on uh, the electron phonon interaction. Uh, it was believed by some people, at least by part of the community, that there was no way to get above a certain critical temperature with the conventional interaction because um, there would be a lattice instability, but that appears not to be the case. Okay, and then the final message, which is the response to Brian Pippard, who can't defend himself, poor fellow, uh, is that superconductivity is a field that constantly renews itself. Okay, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Peter Hirschfeld, for a beautiful, wonderful overview of superconductivity all the way. Uh, more than 100 years of history. You started with the famous 1911, uh, uh, you know, superconductivity curve uh, on, of, on, on uh, Mercury, all the way to present day possible room temperature superconductivity. Thank you very much. It's, uh, it's, uh, we really enjoyed your talk. Um, Thank you. So, well, uh, the, the, the floor is open for questions, but I have, uh, I'll start with the, with, with, with the question, you know, the, this possible, uh, the mixture of uh, H2S, CH4, H2, that, that is supposed to have shown this uh, superconductivity drop at room temperature. So the electronic correlations and high pressure combination, can that be seen in, 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 in regular uh, solid state material. Will there be a, another revolution like what happened with, um, in, you know, uh, YBCO and BISCO compounds? Well, okay, you mentioned a strong correlation in the context of the hydrogen sulfide. I think that's very, very controversial. There have been a few suggestions that strong correlations are present. But as far as I know, the band structure doesn't show any of the very flat bands that are exhibited, for example, in the twisted bilayer graphene. In, in that case, uh, I don't know why we would think that there's strong correlations. Again, there, there are no D electrons uh, at the Fermi surface, so uh, it shouldn't play a role. And uh, I would say that the, the conventional BCS model is without correlations is probably the, the better starting point. That's my you know, opinion, and I think that's the consensus in the community so far. Um, but then, but that doesn't is... answer your question, does it? <laughs> Yeah, the, the, what is making this system so special in, in, in Okay, in, in the yeah, sorry, stuff, and, uh, and I should have said it. I mean, the, um, there, there are a couple of different things. Uh, one of them is certainly the fact that the hydrogens um, have, uh, you know, are very light and therefore have very high phonon frequencies. So uh, you may not be, you know, in, in let's say, in the unconventional superconductivity business, um, and in, in, I think in conventional superconductivity, the, the assumption was that in order to make TC higher, you needed to increase the electron phonon interaction, or, or you needed to increase the attractive pairing interaction. But this is a place where there is a, a modest increase in the pairing interaction, but there's a, a very large increase in the prefactor of the TC expression namely the bandwidth of the excitations uh, because the hydrogens are so light. And those two things, a modest increase in lambda and a very large increase in the frequencies uh, of the excitations seems to combine to give you this, this ITC. So that is you know, the recipe that other people are looking for, searching material space. Material space is very vast and uh, it's hard to have enough insight into what causes TC to make good good guesses, right? I mean, TC is an extremely uh, complicated phenomenon, which is sensitive to bonding and uh, uh, the density of states and uh, the Coulomb pseudo potential and many other things which are hard to estimate a priori. Uh, and if you want to do a high throughput search, which I think have done been been done for other solid state properties like thermoelectricity and so on, it's a much harder problem. But we're working on it. <laughs> Great. It's nice. Uh, Peter, I have a question. Uh, Is that Paskaran? Yeah. So yeah, OK. It's an experimental question, because Jorge Hirsch and uh, Marcelio have been very critical about the experimental aspect. So what is the opinion of the community? Because 
they seem to be minority you know i have not seen anybody else raising similar objection yeah i'm glad you raised the question baskaran i i think it's important that we talk about it um I am not sure I have an opinion myself yet, and I'll tell you why in a second, but let me review for everybody else what, what we're talking about here. Oh, I forgot this thank you slide. <laughs> there we go. All right. So um, here is the first uh, preprint, uh, the first paper posted by uh, Hirsch and Marsiglio, uh, which is a comment on the resistivity data that I showed you before. Um, <clears throat> And essentially, they're pointing out that if you look, these are, are supposed to be type two superconductors. And if you look at uh, the type two superconductors that we know and love, uh, typically what happens is the transition broadens when you apply a magnetic field. And so they're saying, look how sharp these transitions are. This means there's something else going on. Uh, and so, okay, that was the essence of their, their paper. There was an estimate of HC2 and, and things like that in the paper as well. Um, I am not convinced that from a theoretical standpoint, you need to have a broadening in a field. A uh, perfect superconductor need not undergo such a broadening of the transition. However, it is absolutely correct that you normally see this. And it's further correct that in, under pressure, uh, these samples should be messy. They've been a lot of plastic deformation that takes place. And so it's very surprising to me that the critical temperature is as sharp as it is. So, okay, uh, that's one critique. Now, there is a list of other critiques which they have posted, some of which are published and some of which are not, where they have attacked almost every aspect of the experimental claims of superconductivity. First, in the a carbonaceous sulfur hydride, the Diaz compound, or is a material, um, and more recently in the hydrogen sulfide as well. So you see the last two papers here are about hydrogen sulfide. And the, you know, the, the tone is unfortunately getting very um, uh, loud. Uh, if you look at the last title here, uh, on the AC susceptibility of a room temperature superconductor, anatomy of a probable, whoops, scientific fraud. Physica online, Physica C online, um, I wrote 26 December. I don't know why I did that. It's 26 September. It's just a few days ago. So forgive me for that. Um, and then the uh, original paper uh, of Diaz's group uh, has posted the following uh, a, a note, the editors of Nature have been alerted to undeclared access restrictions related to the data behind this paper. We are working with the authors to correct the data availability statement. So what Hirsch has done is he's written to all of the ex experimental authors on these papers and he's asked for the raw data. So many of these preprints say uh, things like, um, I replotted the raw data and they don't support the conclusions in the paper. So there are explicit or implicit accusations of data massaging or data uh, hiding uh, by the authors uh, of the paper. Um, and uh, apparently what happened in the case of the Nature paper is that the um, uh, Hirsch requested the data from the carbonaceous sulfur hydride a nature paper and uh, the authors uh, said that they would not supply the data, even though nature requires, requires you to make a statement about how that you will make the data available. And uh, the claim is that, that it's because of uh, patents considerations, but that's not consistent with the statement uh, on the paper. So, you know, Bhaskaran, I don't have an answer to whether or not all these things are true. Because in, in, in order to understand whether they're true or not, you really have to plot the raw data yourself. Yeah. And I have not taken the time to do that. Uh, I, what I have, what we're trying to do is to get these guys uh, together in the same room. So there's a, 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 a conference that we're organizing at L'Aquila in Italy next summer. Maybe some of you can attend if you're interested uh, on high pressure, high temperature superconductivity. And we have invited uh, Frank Marsiglio and the authors of the experimental papers 
and we'll, we'll probably have a session uh, about uh, discussing this in, in public. I think it's very important that it be discussed. Since you talked about superconductivity, BCS mechanism, if you read between the lines of Jorge Hirsch and earlier paper, he challenges BCS theory itself. So is that a different thing altogether? Because that's something uh, he's very well, open I, about. I, I think you're right. I think that Jorge has uh, personal doubts about the validity of BCS theory. He's one of very few people in the universe <laughs> who have, has taken this point of view. And I think maybe that's why he wasn't taken seriously at the beginning. Hmm. As far as I can tell, the critiques directed at the sulfur hydride are not related to his personal exotic theories of superconductivity. They are based entirely on BCS considerations. Hmm. Uh, and therefore, you know, there's a contradiction. We should, we, well, there's a, a contradiction with what he's published earlier about, about other superconductors, yes, but there's no internal contradiction on that point within these papers, hmm. as far as I can see. Okay. Thank you, Peter. Wonderful yeah. talk. So, uh, so going back to the, the, the plots that you showed, you know, R versus T as a function of uh, the magnetic field. Um, can you just, yeah. So, well, as an experimentalist, uh, I also feel that with the increase in field, there should be broadening. I, I don't have any problem with the sharp drop, you know, at zero Tesla, because uh, even in a single crystal, uh, single crystallized, for example, YBCO, you, you see the delta TC is very narrow, uh, less than 0 0.1, uh, 0.5K. But then as you increase the field, in this case, of course, you can say that you have a very strong pinning in, this, in the system, you know, it's so strong that even at nine Tesla, even though there's a TC drop, TC decrease, the still TC doesn't vanish. But the fact that the field is penetrating so much in the, I mean, one can uh, evaluate the penetration depth, you know, uh, uh, and, and then to that much of penetration for a field inside this superconductor, you expect some kind of broadening, you know, the delta TC should change. Right. And, and let me also note that, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the zero Tesla transition is the least sharp in this picture. Yes. Right. Oh, yeah. So it's not. Yeah, it's uh, it actually <laughs> goes. Small, the other, it goes yeah. the other way. <laughs> yeah, you're right. There's a small tail at the end. Right. There's a. Yeah, exactly. And um, on the other hand, it should also be noted that most of the time we're not looking at data up to 300 Kelvin. Right, so the, the, the width of the transition is still, uh, you know, could be several Kelvin. I don't actually know um, because of the fact that we're up at such high temperatures here. We're looking at a big range. So it's not like looking at uh, niobium 310 or something. And did, did, did they, uh, did the authors uh, evaluate the superconducting volume fraction in the Meissner, uh, you know, Chi versus T? But that's a really only... that's a really good question. I think they did, and I think it's quite small, but that's not uncommon, right? Yeah. So that is also one of my problems, Professor Peter. You know, you you, I I see lots of papers on all these new exotic systems where there are all these sharp drops in the Rho versus T curves, but then when you come to the the magnetic data, the the superconducting volume fraction is very very small. So I, I yeah. so if it's just five percent, I don't know what's happening to the rest of the ninety-five percent of the bulk. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's very, very important that we develop um, new tools to investigate the superconductivity under pressure, um, yeah. and maybe to get more direct. Uh, well, not more, but. Um, additional direct measures of, of uh, superconductivity to check for consistency. It would be nice to do, um, well, no one's probably going to do ARPAs through a diamond, but uh, uh, some, some other tests are, are clearly important. Maybe NMR or something. Um, we could be, could we be do work on uh, a diamond that, you know, uh, we see superconductivity with boron dope diamond, but it, it's six Kelvin. Uh, Professor Baskaran also has a theory that diamond should show 
room temperature superconductivity with nitrogen doping. You know, you have any comment mm-hmm. on that? Uh, no, I know about Professor Braskorn's prediction, but I've never looked at it. I've never gotten into the boron, so I have no comments. I hope I hope he's right. <laughs> <laughs> so, Peter, we will talk about it some other time. Yeah, sure. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, uh, Peter, I also had a quick question uh, regarding the superconductivity in the hydrides, uh, regarding the theoretical uh, part of the work. So how uh, well does, for example, uh, density functional theory uh, perform in uh, determining the structure at these high pressures? I mean, is it able to calculate uh, the electron phonon interaction and maybe the TC? So that's, that's a really good and very essential question. Uh, let me go back a little bit. Uh, let's see, I thought I had some calculations here. I guess I didn't actually show you any of the ab initio calculations. So anyway, I'll leave this up. Um, so I said that um, the ab initio calculations predicted high, superconductivity in hydrogen sulfide. The predictions were uh, within 10 or 20 degrees of, of 200 Kelvin. And so I consider that to be a, a big success, if that, if that is actually correct, if all of it is correct on the theory and the experimental side. Uh, there are also theoretical predictions using density functional theory, which produce um, uh, predictions for high TC superconductivities where, where, where the TC is off by a factor of two, or is the sample is not superconducting at all. So I think this is all in flux right now. I think one needs to be very careful. There are questions about whether or not enharmonic effects are important at these high pressures, and they're typically not taken into account. I mean, what's, what's a little bit a problem sociologically for the field is that it's become very easy to get a DFT code, um, turn the crank, calculate the alpha squared F parameters, and stick them into the Allen Dines equation and get an answer and make a prediction and have it published. And unfortunately, that might not be a high enough standard for, for, that, for that field. For example, I have the yttrium hydride um, uh, discoveries up here. These are all experimental points. If I were to fill this picture with predictions of hydride critical temperatures, it would be dense almost at this point. Um, there are many of them. And in particular, there is a, an yttrium hydride, which was predicted to be a room temperature. And uh, I, as far as I know, I think it's uh, YH10. And I don't think um, that it's, it's been disco- found at all. And I believe that's because of the point that you raise, that the uh, stability of these structures is sometimes taken for granted and uh, not checked. So the first thing you have to do is check the dynamical and the thermodynamical uh, stability of the structure that you're claiming um, might be a high temperature superconductor. Um, those are those are very very important. And I think. And in fact, uh, yeah, sorry. Go ahead. I just wanted to say that I think that the serious people in this field who check the stability uh, do reasonably well within a factor of. 30-40%. And I think that's a spectacular result, personally, given how hard TC has always been to calculate. It's a complete game changer. Yeah, it's probably also a place where maybe uh, there, there could be an amalgamation of uh, how we uh, approach the problem in pure science versus engineering. For example, yes. people who are doing metallurgical engineering stability analysis are almost their uh, step one or, if, or step two. Right. That's their so, bread and butter, so, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that could be interesting. That. Okay. And, and, uh, one uh, just, just la, la, yeah, sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry. Go ahead, go ahead. Shantanu, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, no, I was just wondering. So there was this, uh, there is this clear demarcation, Peter, between uh, these uh, classical superconductors, which were electron phonon mediated. And then for, I don't know, you might have a better uh, understanding of the timeline, but post uh, uh, the cuprate's discovery of 
you know, uh, looking at these unconventional pairing mechanism. Uh, but but the demarcation line seems to be very uh, sharp. So it is more from a philosophical perspective. That is, uh, it, it has always been one mechanism versus the other. Uh, uh, is it like, uh, is it so sharp, the demarcation line, looking at the, you know, whether it's... Let, let me try to paraphrase your question. Are you asking whether or not uh, the electron phonon mechanism and uh, electronic excitations can both be present and affect the TC? If for, for certain superconducting systems. For certain superconductors, yes. I think the answer is absolutely yes. And um, uh, let's see if I can give an example. Well, uh, the, even um, in the early, sorry? Yeah, sorry, go ahead. Sorry. Uh, even in the early days, uh, of the conventional superconductivity in the 60s, it was noticed, um, sorry, not the 60s, what am I saying? In the, in, at the beginning of computational superconductivity, where you, where you just assume the electron phonon interaction, uh, you calculate TC from Eli Ashberg theory, and you do it for various elements, elements. Even for the simple elements and some of the very simple compounds, the binary compounds, you see that there are particular materials where the prediction of TC is, is uh, too high. And it's commonly stated in those papers that uh, spin fluctuations are responsible for suppressing the critical temperature in the S wave state. So the phonon mechanism is dominant, but the spin fluctuation mechanism is, is uh, suppressing TC. But uh, there are no uh, reliable ab initio calculations that take in the uh, spin fluctuation mechanism into account because, frankly, the theory isn't controlled, right? Um, we don't have a small parameter in that theory. Um, and, but people are working on it. And then there are, uh, you know, the, there's the other situation. For example, I'll, I'll point to iron selenide strontium titanate where it's believed that um, by much of the community, let's say that, that the spin fluctuations are there and they cause the majority of TC, but the TC is enhanced by the presence of substrate phonons uh, of, of a forward scattering variety. So yes, absolutely. I think the two are definitely present. Most of the time they are antagonistic. You have one or the other and the other one, the, the subdominant one fights the dominant one. But in very special circumstances, they can help each other. I hope that answers your question. I hope I got the yeah, question yeah, right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's okay. It answers. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Peter, just on the same slide, this nice uh, summary slide, you know, 270 GPA transition temperature close to room temperature. Uh, but, but, but still, we won't be able to record the Meissner signal on these samples at such high pressures. Is it not? It's impossible, uh, and 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 so my, wait wait wait, my... wait 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 there there are there are Meissner there are Meissner experiments on the hydrogen sulfide. What's the difference between hydrogen sulfide and and the carbonaceous? Okay, I don't think there's yeah. any real difference between one fifty five and two seventy. Now yeah, you can yeah. you can uh, Hirsch has criticized the Meissner experiments, um, and I don't actually remember what those cr particular criticisms are, but uh, but I think you sh I think it should be doable. Yeah. I mean, the but, one, so yeah, go ahead, my, sorry. My contention always is with such small Meissner signal volume fraction and with a, such a nice drop in Rho versus T, are we just seeing some kind of, uh, 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 you know, insulated to metal uh, mort-like transitions and then concluding that these are all real superconductors or superconductivity is indeed present? Well, I... It, is the magnetic field dependence consistent with uh, with uh, yeah, a pressure yeah, driven mod transition? Uh, no, what I'm trying to say is you, you get a very sharp drop in, in, in the resistivity curves, but then the micellar signals are always uh, minuscule. So, right. But I mean, yeah. uh, if it were a mod transition, then you would have you would have no micellar effect. So you have to have some something pr producing a diamagnetism magnetism in, in your sample. Yeah. So that's at least, you know, maybe on, on top of the Mott physics, but, uh, but you would need a more complex explanation, I think. I mean, if you read Hirsch's papers, for example, he makes some kind of criticism like this, 
he doesn't have an alternative which explains everything, uh, but he suggests that it could be a non-superconductor. That is one of the suggestions. Yep. Yeah. Oh, nice. yeah. No, I, I, I think I think we need to find ways to uh, treat the sample to improve the Meissner fraction or do something to uh, to really become convinced on that point. I, I agree with you. I'm worried. So as uh, uh, this is an experimentalist question to you, Shantanu, Professor Baskaran, as theorists, you know, with 100 years of superconductivity, 35 years after the high TC discovery in, in, in these unconventional ceramics, do you guys uh, can call us experimentalists and say, hey, you guys go and try these new compounds, you'll get room temperature superconductors. Not with high pressure, just in the ambient. Can, will that happen? <laughs> <laughs> you want a you want a prediction so you can put your money on uh, some company. <laughs> I I I think it will happen. I think it will happen. I don't know the time scale. I'm not willing to, to say anything about the time scale. But yes, I'm pretty optimistic it'll happen. Yeah, I I, I can see your optimism from your eyes. Great, <laughs> wonderful, uh, very nice. So, are there any more questions, Seto? No, nothing. Nothing. This was a very good talk. It was nice. I just enjoyed. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Except I just have a question of what uh, Professor Emerson was saying. See, uh, in the cuprates and uh, nictites, it is easy to make it because they are all at low temperatures. But whereas these hydrates, it's always a pressure involved. Uh, as an yep. experimentalist, still we feel we are comfortable in working at low temperatures than these high fields. Uh, high uh, pressures, I'm sorry, high pressure. Ambient, ambient, uh, ambient pressure, ambient, ambient. these are all very high pressures, right? So sure. Is, is, uh, Professor MSR said, one day you tell us, yes, you can do with ambient pressure, that is the day we are looking for. We will jump in. So and you you tell us that you go and make this material and no high pressure required. And no high pressure. We, we'll do that's, it. <laughs> that's what, that's what I, we're trying to do. Uh, I don't know whether it will succeed, but that's exactly what we're trying to do. We understand that's very important. I mean, it's important uh, also probably to get low pressure superconductors, not just ambient pressures, right. because then we can study them and see what the mechanism is and it'll be a lot easier. Exactly. Right that's now, there are too few groups who can do these experiments. Good. That's that's uh, great, wonderful. Uh, any, any more uh, questions? So, if, if there are no more questions, uh, we let us thank uh, uh, Mr. Peter. Thank you very much for your time and for this wonderful talk. And uh, we we certainly look forward to meeting you in person in our campus. You should visit us, stay with us for whatever number of uh, days that you want, depending <laughs> on your time. And I hope it'll happen soon uh, once the situation become more normal, I would say. Let's all pray for that. I'm, I'm, I second the motion. <laughs> Great would love, to, would love to visit you all. Okay, take care. Bye-bye. Yes. Nice, yeah. Bye-bye. Yeah, thanks Thank you very Peter. much. Thanks a lot.